All right. Um, so pretty much this is an introduction to AAA. Um, as you know, um, at the professional level, there are essential papers and there are optional papers. The optional papers, you can select uh, the papers of your choice out of four. And obviously, audit, advanced audit and assurance is one of those options. Uh, my name is Sheyi Oshibule. Uh, I'm a tutor at Ivy League, and you would also be meeting my Colleagues, I will principally be taking this paper with uh, Tunde and Abib, uh, and you will see them uh, during the class. Now, just to introduce this paper, as you know, uh, it's a three hour, 15 minutes paper. There's a section A and there's a section B. The section A question is 50 marks uh, based on a long case study and uh, predominantly it tests uh, two major areas of the syllabus and these are uh, the planning and risk assessment area or what you can call um, audit of historical information, historical financial information and then also another area we predominantly see here are uh, ethical and professional issues. Okay, ethical and professional issues. So I'll tell you how this links up on the next slide. Um, section B, where you have uh, 25 marks questions, these are more specific areas of the syllabus. Um, and so the examiner may, for example, test uh, questions around audit evaluation and review and reporting. Uh, the examiner's approach states that one of the questions in this area will focus on this section of the syllabus, while the other question may focus on any other area of the syllabus. For example, it could be on other assignments uh, performed by um, practitioners, uh, auditors, as they are called, or it could be um, maybe questions on even audit matters and evidence, okay? Or it may be questions on, uh, you know, other areas of the syllabus. So nothing is so specific on that. And again, as I said, for question one, it's not like these two areas I've identified are the only two areas they can test, you know, but these two areas are the predominant areas that they often test, you know, uh, in question one. Question one will typically expect you to apply your knowledge of multiple areas of the syllabus. And so um, candidates need to be very comfortable with areas like uh, risk, whether it's uh, audit risk, business risk, or a risk of material misstatement. Okay. Um, and then candidates will also need to be very comfortable with planning issues, audit planning issues. For example, understanding the entity and its environment, um, information you will seek as part of gaining understanding of the entity. Uh, and even areas like audit procedures. Uh, these are uh, areas the, that are related, you know, to this first section, which they often test. So asking you to carry out audit procedures on specific items. As I said, section B will be two questions. All questions are mandatory and um, Typically, you would uh, have to deal with a shorter case study, you know, compared to question one, and those will be for 25 marks each. Questions are mainly discursive, but there are some calculations that are often required. For example, where you have to perform, you know, analytical review, calculate some ratios or trend analysis uh, or determining materiality of items. So you would have to do a few calculations. So this is the relational diagram of the syllabus. 
And um, as we can see here, there are several sections of the syllabus. I think we have here uh, seven sections. Now, I typically group this first three sections as one. OK. Yes. So um, then this planning and conducting an audit of historical financial information, which is audit of HFI. You can see it as another major section. And then completion and review, which is audit evaluation, review and reporting, another section. Then you can uh, also assess other assignments as another section. And then current issues is not likely to be examined on its own. In fact, it will not be examined on its own. So most times what the examiner will do is if current issues will be tested, then it will be related to any of these areas. OK, any of these um, other areas. So you may just have a few marks or so you know, clearly related to uh, these areas. So most times uh, at Ivy League, when we teach, we principally focus on, you know, this section one, as I've said here, section two, section three, you know, and section four. Now, um, the regulatory environment uh, pretty much introduces you to audits, advanced audit and assurance paper, and then takes a closer look at uh, some of those regulatory responsibilities that auditors have. For example, issues related to uh, communication with those charged with governance. Um, I say to, um, yeah, I think that's 250 or 260. Um, and then compliance with laws and regulations laws and regulations okay this is 260 compliance with laws and regulations uh so auditors review of you know that area and all, any audit responsibilities related to compliance with laws and regulations so that's isa 250 um and then we have uh fraud and error for example auditors responsibilities related to fraud and error uh considerations in the audit now we then have uh, this other section B, which principally focuses on code of ethics and conduct. OK, so uh, here the syllabus wants candidates to be able to discuss the ethical issues raised, you know, in carrying out an audit or in maintaining independence and those factors that may threaten the auditor's independence and our auditors should generally apply safeguards or put in place measures to reduce tr such threats to an acceptably low level. Um, in this area, you would also deal with uh, things like conflict of interest, uh, issues related to confidentiality, fundamental principles of the ACCA code and the ISBA code and the rest. Um, one key area also here in this Section A is money laundering. We sometimes see the examiner ask candidates uh, questions related to auditors' responsibilities regarding money laundering. Um, yeah, and then we have practice management. So here, um, it then comes down to how do you ensure you run a viable firm, commercially viable, but while at the same time you know, complying with the ethical codes, the regulatory requirements, uh, you know, and technical standards. So in this section, the focus will be on a very important policy and procedure or policies and procedures that firms typically have in place, and that's around quality control policies and procedures, and then every other area relating to obtaining professional work. So. For example, issues related to advertising, do audit firms advertise and, um, you know, how do they get their jobs? What are the re regulations regarding advertising? Um, what are the issues regarding changes in auditors? What are the preconditions for an audit? You know, all those questions will be asked uh, and discussed in detail uh, in that area. 
Now, the major section two, you know, as I said, and perhaps a very, very important area of syllabus is planning and conducting an audit of historical financial statement. Uh, you can pretty much picture a statutory audit when you look at this section. So here, candidates are expected to be able to understand uh, issues related to uh, risk assessment, uh, which is a very, very important part of uh, scope and strategy for an audit. Um, yeah, on things related to understanding the entity and its environment, you know, and then other planning activities that are often carried out and the documentation of such activities like general plan and the rest. Uh, but going on further, this area also looks at the execution phase of an audit, where, for example, you design your audit strategy. Uh, and for example, one, one way the, the test or the technical audit issues here is to ask you about audit matters raised in relation to some technical accounting issues and the audit evidence you would expect to find in respect of those, you know, technical audit and accounting issues. Uh, clearly also related to this section is the concept of group audits, uh, which uh, really is very important, you know, and related topics like related parties, um, transactions, and how, you know, auditors should review related parties transactions and the risks they pose, including using the work of others and you know other salient topics. As I said, this is a very, very important section of the syllabus. Uh, the third section, uh, based on my categorization, looks at completion and review. So uh, typically you will be looking at audit completion topics or audit review topics such as going concern, yeah, uh, subsequent events and the rest. Um, opening balance reviews, uh, comparative information, other information that may be contained in the annual report, opening balances, ETC, and then external audit reports. External audit reports. Actually, both internal and external audit reports can be reviewed, but the emphasis is often based on, you know, past question, external audit report, and one type of internal report, which is report to those charged with governance. You know, for example, in the past, the examiner has asked, based on a scenario, what information will you seek to communicate to those charged with governance, and why will you? communicate those information. Regarding external audit reports, you may be given a sample audit report and uh, you are asked to critically appraise that audit report, which most times often contains uh, one form of deficiency or the other. Then we have the order assignment section of the syllabus. So here uh, you're looking at other forms of assurance and non-assurance engagements that can be carried out by um, you know, uh, auditors or audit firms or accounting firms. Uh, for example, assurance services uh, could include review engagements, for example, such as um, engagement to review forecasts or engagement to review certain key performance uh, indicators, um, or even things like due diligence review, which are often carried out when you are about to embark on an acquisition, whether on the buy side or sell side. And then you may have topics like forensic audits as well, uh, you know, social and environmental audits and the rest. So all this will be explained, all these topics will be explained in more detail, you know, as we take uh, each of these areas uh, in the classroom. Now, what are some of the common mistakes that candidates often make, you know, uh, related to this paper and also advised as advised by the examining team? 
Um, so it's important to pay attention to some of these mistakes. And then when I'm done, uh, um, you know, you can obviously ask for the questions uh, related to this. So for example, um, for triple A, if you look at the pass rates globally, you will see that uh, it's often an average of 3.5 students out of every 10 that pass the paper. OK, so the global pass rate for this paper is quite low. Um, maybe comparable to other, you know, optional papers as well. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's not as easy as it often seems uh, uh, for AAA. Uh, and this, you know, 35% probably also include students that have rewritten or have written the paper before. And so I have some sort of experience in terms of how to attempt uh, uh, the, the, the exam questions. So it's important that you take it with every level of seriousness and, um, you know, paying huge attention to exam techniques, paying huge attention to adequate question practice, you know, um, participating in class, giving your views, getting corrections on your question practiced and all of that. So number one, not directly addressing the question requirements. So for example, um, we often see situations in this paper where students are not properly scoping the requirements of the question and addressing that scope adequately. So let's let me give you an example. So let's say, for example, the examiner says, what audit procedures or so audit procedures will you carry out on the technical feasibility of development cost? Technical feasibility of development cost. Now you've got five marks there. Now, this question is not asking us to audit development cost. The question is asking us to audit technical feasibility of development cost. You remember from IES 38 that development costs are expensed unless they meet certain conditions, about six conditions. One of those conditions is technical feasibility. Management must be able to demonstrate that it is technically feasible that completion of that item, uh, of the item being developed will take place. Now, um, there, if you then start carrying out audit procedures that addresses other conditions, you know, other conditions for capitalization rather than technical feasibility, then it may not end any mark. For example, reviewing, um, let's say, for example, a candidate says, I will agree cost incurred to date to bank statement, okay, or cash book in order to, you know, um, ascertain the accuracy of the carrying value of development costs. Now that's a reasonable point. You want to check that all costs incurred so far on development costs are backed by you know cash payments or actual payments, right? Or maybe you even check to underline uh, supporting documentation if suppliers have supplied certain inputs that is being used as part of the development. Now, one of the conditions for capitalization of development cost is expenditure incurred can be measured reliably. Expenditure incurred can be measured reliably. You get that? Now, the question then is, this kind of procedure probably addresses this condition because you need to verify the expenditure incurred and ensure that you know, it's not overstated or understated, whatever it is. But this procedure, as good as it is for auditing development cost, does not address the word technical feasibility. To assess technical feasibility, 
you may need to narrow down your long list of audit procedures for development costs to things related to establishing technical feasibility. For example, having a direct confirmation or discussion with the, the development team, the scientists, the engineers, and all of that that are actively involved in developing to see whether you know, there are any limitations uh, related to the development. So it's important to scope the question very well. For example, another example may be, uh, maybe a candidate is asked to discuss the risk of material misstatement related to a group audit scenario. Now, the candidates should know that audit risk can include risk of material misstatement or detection risk. So if you are asked to bring out risk of material misstatement, you cannot be discussing detection risk. So what the examiner is saying here is they have seen several situations where candidates are answering their own questions rather than the questions set by the examiner. You will see more of these things as we proceed with the class. Quoting accounting standard without applying them. So at this level, you earn no marks for saying IAS 37 provisions, uh, contingent liability, contingent asset. Uh, the standard states that uh, a provision should be recognized when blah, blah, blah. You state all those interesting conditions. That gives you little or no marks. Okay? You really get the marks for application of whatever the standard is requiring to the scenario given to you by the examiner. Next, using vague uh, phrases without relevant explanation. So this could be in the area of audit procedures. This could be in the area of audit evidence. This could be in, in several areas, even in critically appraising audit reports. So, um, you have to ensure that your statement, what you are telling the examiner is specific and clear and addresses the issues being raised, not just some generic, vague, ambiguous, you know, statements that really can be tied down to the question set. Poor presentation and layout. So if, for example, you are asked to use a briefing note, then we would expect you to have, you know, some sort of title, some sort of introductory paragraph, body, and some sort of conclusion uh, for your briefing notes. Present uh, professional marks are uh, often four marks for this paper, you know, and typically that's in question one. These professional marks do not necessarily vary with the technical correctness of your answers. You can end the professional marks even when you've got, you know, some technical issues with the answers provided because professional marks are clearly related to things like having an introductory paragraph, good layout of your report, logical flow of your points, you know, and having the heading uh, such as store from date and subject. Next, lack of technical knowledge. So it's sometimes also revealed that candidates don't prepare well. Um, most times candidates may just believe, OK, I can just solve as many questions as I can solve and that's enough for the exams. Or I can go for a revision course without reading your text, without reading your uh, materials adequately and believe that's enough. So clearly you, you see that when you are reviewing mock exams, you know, uh, progress test, and you see the quality and depth of responses being provided by certain candidates, you can tell that this candidate is not well prepared. There are some obvious questions. So if an examiner asks you, what are the auditor's responsibilities regarding going concern? It's not something you can start beating about the bush. It's very specific. The standard tells us what the auditor's responsibilities are. So where the responses to such a questions are not clear or not properly applied to the scenario, it's clearly a demonstration of the fact that the candidate has probably not uh, prepared well for the exams. 
Now, your syllabus is really around international standards of auditing. So, um, you know, just as you've got IFRS as your entire SBR syllabus is largely based on IFRS or based on IFRS requirements, you know, we also have ISAs for AAA, okay? And in addition, because audits are based on sets of financial statements prepared in accordance with IFRS, you as audit students must be comfortable, at least an average knowledge of IFRS. Because there are several areas of the syllabus where your knowledge of IFRS will be required. So one of the things we do is we give you summarized notes on IFRS that you can use to complement your preparation for uh, this particular paper. Now, the examining team also continues to emphasize the importance of mock exams. You know, I had to put a slide on this. It's extremely important. Um, if you can get, you know, your tutors to mark your mock exams for you, as we typically do at Ivy League, once lectures have ended, you will have, you know, a period where you can attempt your mock and turn it in for it to be reviewed uh, and feedback provided. You should take advantage of this. A lot of students don't take advantage of this and, you know, it's just one bad way of preparing for your exams. There are some problems that you will never know exist until you do a mock exams. And by extension, there are some exam techniques, for example, time management, that you will never learn until you subject yourself to one or two or three mock exams. I typically recommend three mock exams before your exams. So three hours, 15 minutes, put down your points, what were you able to do? Did you attempt 90%? Did you attempt 100%? Did you attempt 80%? You can tell. And then if you can't get someone to mark all the mock exams for you, the good thing is that ACCA provides the marking scheme for any past question, right? So you can get the marking scheme, see how the marks are allocated, you know, and then um, use that to grade yourself. In fact, grading yourself using the examiner's marking scheme is also a very nice way to have a deeper understanding of how to pass this paper. Now, one important thing also, obviously, before you do your mock exam, would have been the question practice that you would have been doing, practicing questions across uh, the various areas of the syllabus. Now, I often say that it's not just enough to practice questions. Uh, so sometimes you ask someone, oh, how did your exam go? It's not as expected. OK, why did you practice questions? Oh, I finished my exam kit. Now, what question practice means is this. Number one, you have at least an appreciable technical knowledge of the area. Okay, so you must have done some reading, studying, learning, the first phase, trying to understand what the topic is about. Now, if you then pick a question, you are supposed to, in an ideal setting, answer that question, write it down. Now, type it down in Microsoft Word or whatever, the same way you will do in the exam hall. Better candidates will even time themselves, right? Okay, so a 50 marks question, I'm supposed to do it within one hour, 30 minutes. So you attempt the question. It's not, it's not to read the question and just look up and say, okay, audit risk, I think revenue recognition is an issue here. I think provision is an issue here. I think uh, changes in the finance director is an issue here. No, write it down put it down the way you would have done in the exam. Then next, carry the examiner's answers and the marking scheme, and now mark that your answer. Okay? Then once you have done this, you don't move on to the next question. You debrief this question yourself. There are some questions you must ask yourself. Number one, what did the examiner write that I did not write? 
why didn't I think towards that area? Number two, what did I write that the examiner did not write down? Could it be right or could it be wrong? Ask yourself further. Examiner's answers to a large extent are often quite detailed and probably more than what is expected of a student in the exam hall. So if you have an answer that is not on the examiner's list, it may be correct, but you have to do that double check to be sure that there's nothing in the scenario that makes that answer incorrect. Number three question. What are the learning points from this question that can apply to other scenarios? You know, you ask yourself several questions. In what other way can they test this same question? How did I do with time? You know, there are questions to ask yourself. What did they allocate more marks for? How could I have picked easier marks? For example, the examiner must have allocated marks for computing materiality. Did I compute materiality? That's an easy thing to do, and it's usually one mark. Did I did do trend analysis? Usually half mark. Easy thing to do. So you ask yourself those questions. You just don't read question, read answer, and then you move to the next question. Read question, read answer, you move to the next question. No, that's not what question practice entails. I'm sure you've heard of the 20, 40, 80 rule. This research shows that we as humans retain 20% of what we hear. We retain 40% of what we hear and see. But we retain 80% of what we hear, see and do. Herein lies the importance of practicing, not reading. All right, I guess that is clear. Now, the examining team then, uh, you know, has a couple of advice here, which yeah, you can always go through the details, you know, that we have here. I will just highlight a few of them, uh, some of which I might have mentioned. You know, how to approach the AAA exams. Uh, it, it has a wide ranging syllabus, which includes audit of historical information and other specific areas. It builds on, you know, audit and assurance at the skills level and also on SBR, so particularly the IFRS standards that you learned in SBR. So typically, if you have not done SBR and you want to do AAA before SBR, it's not the best. It's not the best. But you may be doing the two papers at the same time. That's fine. Or you might have done SBR and now you want to do triple A. OK. Um, so it introduces complex topics and also, you know, extends the basics, basic ones. Um, so as we have said, these are the various areas of the syllabus. And what's the essence of the paper? The aim of the syllabus is to analyze, evaluate and conclude on the assurance engagement and other audit and assurance issues in the context of best practices and current developments. So, um, you know, this is a diagram pretty much showing uh, the foundations of, of this paper. So typically for an engagement, you start with, you know, confirming that you can do the work, you accept the engagement, you, uh, you, you sign off your contract, you know, you carry out your pre-acceptance procedures. And then in the next phase is typically planning, a very important phase. And that's why it's uh, a key area as well in this paper. Then the next is execution, which is performance of, you know, the assignment. And then finally, you, you move to the final phase, which is completion and review. How to prepare, make use of ACCA resources. So you see huge resources on ACCA's website. I advise uh, everyone to go to the section of ACCA website on Triple A, you will see lots of useful materials that will help you as part of your preparation. You know, some 
uh, you know, our articles, technical articles on technical areas. Some are, um, you know, um, you know, examiners' comments or examiners' review of past questions. Past questions as well are there and all those things. Um, cover the entire syllabus and ensure you cover the more important ones very well. Learn how to apply and use knowledge. So very little questions here around uh, knowledge, testing your knowledge. It's often application of your knowledge, okay? Practice planning questions, writing full answers and revise them thoroughly. Did you see that? So that's what I was talking about on the previous slide. Plan your answers to the question, write them out, and then review thoroughly. So once you compare with the examiner's answer, what are the things that I should take away from this question? Uh, at a point, I, I feel like it's often important to stress these three letters. R for read, so you read the question. T, as you can see, is capital letter for think. A lot of candidates don't do that. Then W for write, which is obviously answering the question. As a candidate for this paper, you need to spend quite some time thinking and planning how you want to, you know, scope the question, answer the question and present your answers. Links to support resources. So lots of support resources. That's what you have here. You can always, you know, identify them on ACCA's website. Typical verbs that are often examined uh, in this paper are evaluate, so they can ask you to evaluate audit risk or explain or discuss, you know, certain issues. So obviously, as you can see, these are higher level requirement verbs. Question approach. Um, yeah, so analyze the wording of the requirement carefully. Very important so that you don't miss out key points in the requirements. A requirement may, for example, say uh, evaluate and recommend. So while evaluation may allow you to go through different perspectives, pros, cons, what's the need for this stakeholder, what's the need for that stakeholder, the word recommend is actually specific. And so there will be marking, mark it on the marking scheme for did this candidate conclude by recommending a particular course of action? So you have to be very careful. Use the mark allocation to guide the length and breadth of the answer. So don't overwrite, don't underwrite. That's why it's important to also use the examiner's marking scheme before you enter the exam hall so that you get used to how marks are allocated. And some of these things we will be clearly explaining in the classroom. Read the first paragraph to understand the assignment. Read the first paragraph to understand the assignment. You know, the, I, I will be explaining, for example, uh, during the class on the importance of first paragraph in any AAA paper. There are three major things you must pick out from the first paragraph of a case study, particularly for this paper, and you will get all of that. Uh, as we proceed. Invest time in active reading of the scenario. You must understand the scenario for you to solve the question. A doctor cannot recommend a medication or, uh, you know, solve a medical problem without appropriate diagnosis. It's the same thing for you as a candidate. You must understand the problem, the case study clearly, before you recommend an answer. Identify relevant technical knowledge, you know, for example, accounting as well as auditing uh, ISAs, IFRS, you know, that you will need to apply in the context of the question. Then apply this to the scenario, organize your planned answers, check that you have answered, used all information and exhibit before writing out your answers. Writing a good answer is how to demonstrate professionalism, pay attention to layout and presentation, write clearly and concisely, and then, um, you know, uh, relevant content uh, must add value. Not simply restating the facts. So, yeah, so lots on there on um, um, exam techniques. Now, as I wrap up this section, uh, uh, I, I quickly want to talk to you about 
you know, the two forms of lectures that we have at Ivy League for this paper, which is triple A. Uh, so we've got the intensive class and we've got the standard class. Uh, typically, the intensive class is for eight weekends. Eight weekends, seven weekends, eight weekends typically. And, you know, based on our contact hours, that may be 32 uh, hours because the class is uh, for four hours with breaks in between. Um, standard class. So effectively, an intensive class is an intensive revision course. So you should not come with to an intensive class with the mindset of everything I need, the lecturer will provide. <laughs> it means it's not even possible to do that in a standard class, not even to talk of the intensive class. The standard class is 12 weekends of lectures plus six weekends of revision. So you can see that they are not the same in terms of duration and the amount of time the lecturing team has, you know, to um, uh, teach and practice questions as the case may be. So that's in terms of duration. Now, who is it for? Targets, okay? Typically, the candidates that you'll do an intensive class are those students that maybe for one reason or the other, you didn't pass the paper in your first attempt. So you are receiving the paper. So that means you already have some sort of knowledge, you know, around how to do this paper. And please don't deceive yourself. If when you attempted it the first time, you didn't prepare at all, and obviously your marks also show that, you know, you were not well prepared, the foundation is weak. It may be better to go for a standard class, okay? Uh, it's also for those students who have taken standard lectures before. So I'll just call that taking standard lectures before. So you've taken standard lectures, but you didn't write the exam. For example, you took standard lectures for June. You didn't write the exam. You want to write in September. You still want to complement it with a revision course. OK, or those that have been doing detailed self-study themselves. OK, and so they believe that um, you know, I, I only need to complement this, my personal efforts with a revision course. But for standard class, anyone can come in, okay? Anyone. Typically first timers, but pretty much anyone. Now, um, next, the approach, which really is the final point here, the approach. Most times, the approach to teaching an intensive class is to provide an overview of the area of the topics, okay? So not detailed teaching, overview of the topic, the key things you need to know, and then we'll let you know what you need to go and read on your own in more detail, and then practice questions, okay? Practice questions. For uh, a standard class, that's a detailed review of the topics, okay? And then obviously also lots of practice questions. Okay, so those are the four uh, or three main differences between an intensive class and um, a standard class. Uh, and then obviously the, the, the um, uh, one is targeted at September and March. Uh, so this is exam timing. Uh, this is for September and March students. Uh, while this is typically for uh, June and December students. So although I can also say any diet because you can take your lectures for June and decide to write your exam in September. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's really it for introduction to this paper.